Ladies and gentlemen, Rochelle Diamond. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming to the speaker series today. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I'm on our employee experience team here at LinkedIn, and I get to run our speaker series, which is all about bringing inspiring ideas and innovative thinkers to make you, our employees, and our members more productive and successful. You can always see all our past speakers at speakers.linkedin.com. And we also have a podcast channel on iTunes, so definitely check that out as well. So I am so excited today to introduce our very inspiring speaker. We have Captain Jim Weatherby here. He is a real life astronaut. Not only has he been, he was the only person to lead the space shuttle missions five times, he's also been involved in very high profile projects such as researching the Challenger explosion and the BP oil pipeline spill, <coughs> excuse me, to ensure that accidents like that don't happen again. And on top of all of that, he is one of the nicest people that I've had the pleasure to meet and work with. And I'm sure you will understand more about that when you get to meet him. So Jim's gonna tell us amazing stories from his time in space. He's gonna share with us some risk management techniques that we can use in our everyday life. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Captain Jim Weatherby. Thank you so much for coming, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so as you know, we talked about our special tradition that we have at LinkedIn, where when new people come, they share with us something that's not on their LinkedIn profile, and they demonstrate a special skill or talent. And Jim has been kind enough to agree to participate in this tradition with us. So we will start with what is not on your LinkedIn profile? So I had a pretty fun opportunity on my first mission other than flying in space, I was able to bring some drumsticks up into space. Now we had to cover them with beta cloth material. It's a flam uh, fireproof material because you can't bring things that are flammable up in space. So that's what I did. I brought drumsticks up in space and actually played on the console. That's amazing. And I heard you got some kind of recognition for that? Well, after I landed, the, um, the Drummer's Trade Magazine called Modern Drummer did an article about me and they billed me as the fastest drummer in the world. In the universe, maybe? <laughs> There's a picture of Jim in space with his drumsticks. Last millennium, you can tell I'm a lot younger. <laughs> nice, and so what would you say is your special talent? Well, being as how this is a pretty rocking place, what do you think? Should we rock out? Well, so we just happen to have, look, look over here. We have a drum set and we have two LinkedIn employees, Alex from Media Productions and James from Product Operations. And they're gonna, oh, go ahead, they're gonna rock out for us and we're gonna get to see Jim's special talent. Can we get a round of applause, round of applause. <laughs> they just met this morning. But you won't know it. Keep going. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you so much. I think we should start all of our speaker series this way. We have a new LinkedIn speaker series jam band. Uh, Thanks guys so much for participating. Alex and James, you guys rock. And Jim, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. So I got so into it, I missed the uh, signal for the landing there. <laughs> I wanted to keep playing. Um, this part is fun for me also. So I really have a lot of fun coming and talking to people about risk. I feel so fortunate I was able to do the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was 10 years old, um, and that is to fly in space. 
For 35 years, I've been working in dangerous environments, and I absolutely love it. But it's not the danger that I like. In fact, I don't like danger at all. I, I don't like the feeling of adrenaline. What I like is controlling the risk. And that's what I want to talk to you today about, is how do you control risk? Um, as I go through this, I'll, I'll share with you some space stories and some stories from uh, being in hazardous environments. But think about it in the business context. Um, so who can tell me the mission statement for LinkedIn? Is a test. Anybody? It doesn't have to be exact. Opportunity for the world's workforce. Connecting professionals to help them be successful and productive, right? Every word matters. So as you think about that mission statement, and by the way, think about how your work contributes to the mission of the company. And every word matters. So connect, obviously, that's a pretty easy one. But think about how do you help the customers be productive and how do you help them be successful? And how do you know whether or not they're productive and successful? Just because they get connected, you still have to figure out how you're going to do that or somebody in the company does. The point is, as you come to work and do your daily activities, make sure you're constantly in the back of your mind or in the front part of your mind thinking about the mission statement. It's critically important. Uh, let me get into what I wanted to talk about, and I'll show you where it ties into your mission here at LinkedIn. Um, so when I graduated college, I didn't want to get a real job, so I decided to join the US Navy and learn to land on aircraft carriers. This is a picture of the USS Forrestal. We're in the final left-hand turn in preparation for landing. And I knew the organization was going to give me the proper skills and knowledge, or sorry, knowledge and skill to do the job. And there's a third element, anybody who's involved in training knows it's knowledge, skill, and attitude. I didn't quite understand the attitude part yet, but I knew the organization was going to give me the proper knowledge in ground school training. I knew they were going to give me the skills in practice, either in flying airplanes or flying the simulator. I also knew the organization and I were partners in my success and my survival, in fact, because it is a pretty dangerous environment. But I held 51% of the corporate vote, and so I wanted to study and practice more than the organization was allowing me to. So before I ever flew a jet the first time, when I joined the US Navy, I had no previous flight experience. Um, I became friends with the night shift janitor in the simulator building and he allowed me to sneak into the building and practice in the simulator. By the time I flew the first time in the US Navy in a jet, I had six times as many hours as my friends because I would go in and fly from one in the morning till five in the morning till people would come in. Um, so I think that is one thing that you can do here in your workplace, become the best at what you do. Whatever your job is, figure out how to become the best at it. And that might mean you have to work really hard at it. Go ahead. Um, so good question, when did I sleep? You know, when you're young, you don't, <laughs> you don't need a lot of sleep. I didn't actually fly until you know, a couple weeks later. So this was a week that I didn't have to perform or fly. Um, but you know, and the classes weren't all day long. So it's a good question, but you can sleep in the, in the uh, late afternoon, early evening, and then wake up and go in and practice. But you know, jumping in a jet and flying, I mean, I, again, with no previous flight experience, I didn't want to do that without doing everything I could to practice. The third element I didn't realize how important it is the mental attitude. I realized on a night, it was early in my career, and so this, that was a daytime picture. Um, this is what it looks like at night when you're approaching the ship. And your projection system is pretty good here at LinkedIn. I would expect nothing less, by the way. Some places ago, you can't hardly see it, but that's like it is in the real world. Sometimes you can't hardly see it until on short final. Um, but I, as, as is the case with a lot of uh, young people in, the, in their 20s, I began to think that I was pretty good and my confidence, in fact, was outrunning my actual capability. And I was coming down one night on a particularly dark and dangerous night. Uh, all the other pilots were getting scared. I could hear it in their voices. And I was thinking what a great job I had. My brother's got a lousy job back in New York as, at New York as a golf teaching pro. And here I was flying the 
you know, the best airplane in the world, had the best job in the world. And I suddenly realized that confidence is good, but overconfidence can be dangerous. And about the time that I figured out that I was about to die and I crossed the ramp to a hard landing, I realized I had done this to myself. Unfortunately, I didn't damage any of the hardware. The only thing that was damaged was my psyche as I smashed into the aircraft carrier. And I taxied up to the darkest part of the ship and shut down. And I, and I could not unstrap because I realized I did this to myself. I lost concentration when it mattered. And I told myself in the next 10 minutes as I sat there, don't ever let yourself want your mind wander. You know, sometimes the hazards are not always in the external environment. Sometimes they're inside my helmet. So I promised myself I would de develop the proper mental discipline to focus when it was required um, in a dangerous uh, environment. The second time I learned how important attitude is was the night before my first launch attempt. This is actually my second flight, but when your head hits the pillow on the night before your first launch attempt, I suddenly realized I've run out of time to get any smarter and it's too late to quit. So I had to deal with that. How was I going to get a good night's sleep so I could wake up the next morning? I mean, it's just the same question that you just asked. You have to get a good night's sleep to be able to perform at peak effectiveness the next morning. So I thought about that and my first thought that came to my mind was, well, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was 10 years old. Great thought, but not sufficient. I could still die tomorrow and that's not what I wanted to do since I was 10 years old. So something else I needed to think of it took me about 20 minutes and I finally realized that tomorrow when I wake up, if bad things start happening and the vehicle starts coming apart and we start having malfunctions and failures and engine outs, uh, I decided I was gonna work my hardest and save in priority order the crew, the vehicle, and the mission. And that has stuck with me through the years. In a sense, I was taking myself out of the equation. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I could die tomorrow, it does not matter. If I can save my crew, then I'll be happy. If I can save the vehicle, great. If I can complete the mission, even better. But I still think of that even in tough situations like playing with a couple of guys, you know, there's not a lot of physical risk, but there certainly is some amount of risk. And I think about when I'm playing, it's not about me, it's about the guitar players. They're the ones that are creating the music. And so many other things in life, if you think it's not about you, it's about the other person. And so it, it speaks to one of the values that you have in LinkedIn about relationships, right? Relationships matter. In fact, they're more important than my own feelings. So, that, so that's what I was doing. I was taking myself out of the equation. And it allowed me to go to sleep and, and get a good night's sleep and wake up the next morning and stay focused on the present uh, to be able to complete the mission. Um, just a quick, I think I have one or a couple of word slides, not too many, most of them are pictures, um, just to kind of set the stage. What happens after an accident? Now Rochelle mentioned that I had been involved in the Challenger accident, also the Columbia accident, the Texas City disaster, the Deepwater Horizon accident, all these major tragedies and disasters. What happens in an organization typically after an accident? Blame, but before that, investigation, they try to figure out what happened. And then all of a sudden, one of the products that comes out are rules and procedures. Here's the way we can avoid this kind of an accident in the future. And that's great. And rules and procedures are very important. In fact, they're mandatory. And they'll help you prevent most accidents. But what's missing if you want to prevent unknown accidents or something that you had not foreseen or thought about? We, in the astronaut office, learned to supplement the rules with, the, with um, principles-based techniques. And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, for the rest of my time with you is principles-based techniques. Unless you have questions about music or drumming later, I'll talk about that too. Um, but the principles and the techniques are discretionary. They're open, they're adaptive. So a quick illustration to show you the difference most companies have a rule that says you can't use a cell phone if you're driving on company time. So if you follow that rule, you'll prevent most accidents. But what's a better principle if you want to prevent all accidents in a car? How about don't be distracted? How about see and avoid all hazards that are out there? Maybe it's not 
um, the cell phone conversation, maybe it was the conversation I'm having with people in the car or the radio. I was driving a, a, to a speech recently on a, a dark and stormy night, just like on the ship, and I reached up and turned off the radio because it was time to focus on the external environment and the hazards that are out there. So if you use proper defensive driving techniques, that's a principles-based technique. When you supplement that with rules, now you'll be able to prevent all accidents and at LinkedIn, following a certain set of principles and the good techniques, you'll help people around the world to connect and be productive and be successful. It's not the rules that are gonna help you do that, it's gonna be the principles and the values that you have at LinkedIn. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about is a, a system of principles and techniques that helped us in the office um, face hazards and, and stay alive to complete the mission. There's three advantages to using principles to supplement principles, uh, the rules with principles. First, now you do have a kind of a mental attitude that you can talk to people about. You know, it's, you can't like say, like your mother did maybe when you're five years old, come here, let me talk about your attitude a little bit. You need to improve your attitude, young man. Um, it's tough to do in the professional world, but now you have a certain set of principles that you can use, and you'll see that all of these are, in a sense, mental attitudes. Um, and, and also, it improves safety, it helps you prevent all accidents, and it helps you be successful as a company if you're following a certain set of principles. So with that kind of a big lead-in, here are some examples of principles that we found help over the years. Um, I also, by the way, this is a picture I took, uh, uh, or somebody took of me on the Russian space station Mir, and I, I realized that I could split the techniques into different categories, and the three that I'll talk about today, um, and, and I use the different body parts to, to help me remember the different categories. It's things I see, things that I really believe that are in my heart, and things that I do, so that's the kind of manual part. So the first one I'll talk about is commitment to mission and people. We've already talked about the LinkedIn mission statement. Um, commitment, I, I've found that uh, leaders in hazardous businesses do things differently than other leaders. The first thing is they're intensely committed to the mission. That's why I'm such a big proponent on you got to know what the mission statement is of your company and then think about it all the time. Um, in this sense, it's commitment to the mission of flying in space and the people who are helping me contribute to that mission. And it's not because they're helping me to uh, complete the mission, it's because I care about them enough that I want them to be successful and self-actualized and that kind of a thing. So that's just the first category, not very important. You can have whatever category you want. Here's the first one. Uh, the technique we call balance confidence with humility. This is a picture of, and, and it speaks directly to uh, relationships matter, one of the values here at LinkedIn. So here, here's the story. These are the instructors and the flight controllers in the Mission Control Center. When I was the director of flight operations, I had a communications device in my office and I could listen to the debriefs of the crews, the flight crews who reported to me who were in uh, debriefs with the controllers from the Mission Control Center after an integrated simulation in preparation for a mission that might be four or five months down the road. And often I was embarrassed to hear the flight crews talking and debriefing with the controllers and sometimes they would blame the flight controllers. You, 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 one of you talked about blame after an accident, which is typically what happens, and we also look for the lowest level person to blame. Um, but I would hear the flight, the, the flight crews blaming the controllers for not helping to solve the problem. Worse, I sometimes heard flight con the, the, the flight team, the astronauts, blaming the controllers for not helping the astronauts when they made a mistake. It was a mistake the astronauts made and they were still were blaming the other people for not helping them enough. So I had a rule on all the missions that I commanded, we were not allowed to blame anyone else. We were only gonna look in the mirror and see how did I fail to contribute to that. The upside for me was we weren't embarrassed, but the unintended consequence that I didn't realize was now the flight controllers loved working with us. They would come earlier, they would help us more they would take more than their share of the blame. And then it translates to the real mission in space uh, where the missions I flew um, were wildly successful. We made the fewest mistakes of any crews I've ever seen, not because we were a good crew, but because we involved the ground team. We had such a good relationship with them before we launched that they were able to help us to trap the errors or prevent the errors before we made the errors. Um, the technique, of course, is what we call it balanced confidence with humility. And I often ask people, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but I often ask, do you know people who show a lot of confidence 
in your workplace, but maybe don't show enough humility. And I think we all know those kinds of people. We do. Generally, I do get people to volunteer and they do raise their hand. So balance confidence and humility. Humility is a very important part of a, even a technical business and certainly is part of a high risk or a dangerous business. You have to have the humility to know, I don't know everything. There are hazards out there that are trying to kill me. How do I find them? Um, here's the second technique. This is a, it's called demand operating excellence for myself first. Again, speaks right to one of your values, which I think is in fact literally demand excellence, right? Who, who are we demanding excellence from is the first question I'll ask. Um, my, myself, that's, I, I can control only one person in this entire universe and that's myself. Now I can try to influence others, so that's the second part, then inspire others. But demand operating essence for myself first. Here's a story, it's a, this is a large vacuum test chamber that we have in Sandusky, Ohio, um, in a place called Plumbrook. And we used to bring in the, the vehicles, the, um, the spacecraft in preparation for going to the moon back in the Apollo days and it would do thermal vacuum testing in this big chamber. And I had an opportunity to meet the maintenance supervisor. He was running the crew that did the maintenance on the facility. They had a very good reputation, very few mistakes made, uh, no injuries. The facility was in a high state of readiness. So I met this gentleman and I asked him, well, you're so successful when you do make a mistake or your crew makes a mistake or there's an accident or a problem or the facility is down, can you characterize what caused that? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, well, you know, if they do make a mistake or there's a problem, it's only one of three possible reasons. Either I didn't tell them exactly what I wanted them to do, that's the requirements part, or I didn't give them the proper tools or the time to do the job, that's the resources part, or I put them in a position where they were not trained, they weren't ready to do the mission. And it occurred to me, he's looking in the mirror, he's saying, here's how I failed my crew. The upside for him, they love working for him, they make fewer mistakes. If they do make a mistake, they readily admit it, knowing that he's not gonna blame them. If they need a better tool, they'll ask for it. He'll do everything he can to give them the tool or the more time to do the job. And overall, they work more, much more effectively because they love working for him. He's demanding operating excellence from himself first in giving them the proper readiness and the training to do the mission. And that's why they're so successful. Um, here's the second part of the same principle. So this is a, a platform down in the Caribbean. I had an opportunity to meet a supervisor here who was running the welding crew. So their job was to do the welding on the platform. And he was clearly a, a, a student of human behavior and he had a, a really good crew there, the best crew in the fleet in doing the, the welding. And I asked him, when your crew goes to work in the morning, how do you inspire them? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, you know, if my crew, welded 95 feet yesterday, which is the metric they have, the linear feet that they weld. I don't ask them, please weld 100 feet today. I ask them, please weld correctly. Let's figure out how to be really good welders. Let's be the best welders in the fleet. The upside is they have become the best welders in the fleet. Um, he helps them, they help him. And often they do exceed 95 feet, um, whatever they did yesterday because they're making fewer mistakes, fewer failed inspections, uh, and, and they just are becoming better and better at it. So he's inspiring them to greatness. That's what you need to do as leaders in, in LinkedIn is help your people be successful internal to the company so they can help, you know, contribute to the mission statement of helping others be successful. I'm gonna jump to risk awareness, which again is one of your values, right? What's, what's the value that you have here in LinkedIn regarding risk? Take intelligent risk, very good. Um, well, how do you do that? You can take risks, but how do you take intelligent risks? So now we're starting to speak to the attitude that people have, the risk awareness. Um, here's how I, uh, by the way, this is a picture I took on the western coast of Sardinia way back in uh, a long time ago. I'm flying an A7, uh, and I took a picture of my two wingmen. We got kind of lucky, the wave was breaking below, and a nice picture. Um, but when you're flying an airplane like this, you're constantly aware of the risk around, the hazards that are all around. You begin to develop an ability to be aware all the time. Here's how you do it. Three sub-techniques, and I can never remember things, so I put them into categories or lists. I think of the concepts of past, present, and future. So in the past, search for vulnerabilities. Here's the point. There's no boat, lawnmower, airplane, 
any car, anything I've ever flown or operated without fully trying to understand how can this system kill me? That's all rooted in the past. How do I do that? Well, I read the owner's manual for sure. Um, talk to other operators. Uh, maybe I call the manufacturer, or if it's, a, if it's an airplane, I call some test pilots and ask them what was it like in testing. Um, I read accident reports to see what bad, how has this system killed people in the past or, or injured people, all rooted in the past. In the present, we develop the ability to maintain situational awareness. Kind of a difficult thing to do, but you can train your brain to constantly be aware, of, and I'll show you some examples of how this works here in a bit. And then finally, the most difficult one, anticipate how the risk is changing. Even as, as I use a system in its intended operation, the risk is changing, and I'll show you how, uh, a couple of examples of how that works. So the first one, before I landed the space shuttle the first time, I, I learned from some of the experts that the weakest part of the landing and rollout system are the brakes. It's the largest vehicle and the heaviest vehicle of this weight class that has only four main tires, and they didn't have enough energy absorption capability. So I didn't use the brakes on my landings uh, very much. And in fact, I have, of the five landings I have, two of them are the la longest landings in the history of the program. I don't stomp on the brakes. The upside for me, I didn't blow a tire and I retained control. Unintended positive consequence after those two landings, the maintenance crew came up to me and shook my hand and said, thank you very much for going easy on the brakes. We don't have to change the brakes like we do on every other flight. So it speaks to another one of the principles, protect your hardware and it will protect you and the systems as well but understand the vulnerabilities in, in whatever you're operating. Here's one a little closer to home and, and down on the surface of the earth. So this is, I used to live uh, down in Houston, Texas, and this was a, a little tiny road that um, there's only two ways to get out of our neighborhood and both of them were just like this. And the point is, as I'm driving down this road, I realize I'm vulnerable on a single lane road with these concrete abutments on the side. What if that 3,000 pound death machine gets distracted and he or she starts drifting into my lane. There's not much I can do with this ditch here and these concrete abutments all the way down this road. So I'm, I understand the vulnerabilities and now I'm very aware. I'm not thinking about the meeting I've just come from or my arrogant boss. I'm thinking about that other car that's approaching me and I give myself a split second extra time. If you don't think it happens, it periodically does. Down in Houston, we'll see people in the ditch about once a month. Right next to, by the way, the yellow sign that says drive safely. <laughs> Can you see the body language indications of somebody who's not maintaining awareness? And, and I propose yes, and I'll show you in the next slide. Here's the story. An aircraft carrier, uh, the hook grabs onto, for landing, the hook grabs onto this one inch steel braided cable, pulls it out of hydraulic spools, and it decelerates the airplane from about 135 knots to zero in two seconds. It's a great carnival ride. Most of the time it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't and the cable snaps. And when it does, it becomes a rotor router. It goes slinging down the flight deck. And if you don't see it coming and jump over it, it will cut you in half. It doesn't happen very often. It has happened in the past. As I show you this next picture, see if you can identify which person looks like he's not paying attention. So the person in the dark shirt here, if this happens in the US Navy, the supervisor comes up and whacks you in the back of the head back in those days, pay attention, and they teach us how to pay attention all the time. And that becomes an ingrained habitual pattern where we're always aware of the surroundings and the hazards. So I don't move around too much when I do my talk, but I'm consciously, constantly, always aware of the edge of the stage here, even though I'm talking to you because it's about the only hazard I have here. Earlier, I maybe could have got electric, not really, just kidding. But I'm always aware of the hazards around, so that's maintained situational awareness. And you can teach people in hazardous environments. It's amazing how complacent people will become in a dangerous environment. There's a particular reason why complacency happens. It actually comes from a good feature in the human brain we can talk about later if we have time. How do we do the thing that's the most difficult, which is anticipate risk? So here's an example of uh, the people gate that we used to run through uh, for 18 years. I was uh, in preparation for space flight. We would jog and I, I would go at lunchtime and we'd go through this people gate. There's a particular hazard here once I started teaching this course on, on identifying hazards. It's a little tough to see, so I'll flip the camera around and show you. And I'll ask you the question, where is that rusty spring going to go if it suddenly breaks? But the more salient question is, 
when is it more likely to break? Well, it's not gonna be when the gate is sitting there dormant and there's no one around. It's going to be because somebody is opening the gate and it's scraping now on the metal and that's when it suddenly cuts loose and hits you in the jugular vein or the eye. So anticipate that as I use a system, the risk is actually increasing, even if I'm using it in its intended operation. Now, clearly it's not intended for the spring to be rusty, um, so that can be fixed. Um, let's jump to, um, so I did this once and I was talking to a, a professional accident investigator and he actually disagreed with me. Here's, here's my statement. If you put all three together and I'm driving down the road, the light is green, but I'm in a very low eye height car, do I go sail into the intersection? Well, no, because I know I'm vulnerable at intersections. That's one of the most vulnerable times because somebody may run the red light and T-bone me. Um, um, so I'm aware, but I can't maintain awareness because I can't see in both directions the way the cars are. So I'll slow down in this situation and I will not go through the intersection without being able to verify that nobody's gonna hit me. And this professional accident investigator said, well, now you're gonna create an accident from somebody rear-ending you. Well, I'm sorry, but I disagree. I'm not going through that intersection blind. So I'm putting all these techniques together in a principled way and making sure that I don't have an accident like I still haven't in 40 years of driving. I should have asked him how many accidents he's been in. Here's somebody who clearly, or a group of people who clearly weren't doing the risk awareness. They were not controlling the risk. By the way, I, I distinguish between managing risk, which is what organizations do, and controlling the risk, which is what you must do. Individuals must control the risk. Yes, you have to follow the rules of management, risk management, but you have to understand the principles of how you control the hazard. I'll jump to the next one. This is sort of a, a longer category. I'm also cognizant of the time because I do want to take questions at the end um, if, if you have any, and I'll stick around after it if, we, if I do run out of time. So the do the right thing section, um, and I'll propose to you uh, that safety, of all the rules and policies and procedures you have in an organization, safety rules are the ones that are the most tempting to be violated. Here's a picture of a couple of folks that are violating this rule of no trespassing. They didn't think they'd get caught, but they did by my camera. The, by the way, the technique is called follow procedures and rules thoughtfully. So we had a saying in astronaut office, there's only two ways to get in trouble with procedures. Do not follow them or to follow them blindly because they're written by other humans and they may have errors or mistakes in it or maybe they don't apply today. So you have to really understand the procedure. What's the rationale behind the procedure and the rule? These people, I'll bet you did not understand, or maybe they did, the rationale for the rule, it's not the obvious one of getting hit by a train. If anybody's familiar with up in Anchorage, Alaska, this is the turning an arm off the Cook Inlet. And the real reason is you can get stuck in the mud during low tide and the tide comes in very fast and people have drowned in this area before because they could not move out of the kind of quicksand environment. But think about that, rules, safety rules are the ones that your people are the most tempted to violate. Think about why that is and talk about that later if you want. Sometimes rules are overly prescriptive. There's probably a reason why this was done and I think I can postulate a reason. Sometimes rules in your organization are contradictory or confusing. Uh, up in space, we live and die by the procedure. We do not open a hatch. Here's an internal hatch in the International Space Station. We follow a 13 step procedure to open a hatch. Certainly you don't wanna open up to a vacuum or to some toxic material on the other side of the hatch. But more importantly, you wanna leave the hatch in a configuration ready to be quickly closed in an emergency situation. So you don't just blindly go open a hatch, you follow a procedure. It's very obvious in space, you can die if you don't follow the procedure. Not so obvious, here's the toilet, people always wanna see the toilet. But here's the, the thing I like to show, the procedures for using the toilet. Not so obvious, but if you, realize that your butt is indirectly connected to the vacuum of space as you're opening valves, it's actually venting um, the odors and keeping the material inside. You do not want to make a mistake on the toilet, so we use a pretty extensive set of procedures. Um, here's another technique called expect failures. And by the way, they'll occur at the worst possible time in the worst possible scenario. There's a reason for that as well, not just in the system, but in humans. Um, two examples, uh, just briefly, when we connect the space station, uh, the, the space shuttle to the space station, there's an area um, in between the two closed hatches when we first connect called the vestibule. 
we do not open a hatch to go in and shake hands and see the other crew without verifying that we have proper leak, uh, uh, proper pressure integrity in this vestibule area. So it's a pretty extensive procedure. It takes uh, you know, sometimes 30, 40, 50 minutes to go through and verify there's no leaks. We understand that concept, expect failures. This is a diagram of the Deepwater Horizon where they did an almost identical procedure to verify the pressure integrity of the well down uh, five miles below the platform. And they didn't really, I don't think, expect uh, failures. You can make a mistake when you're checking the pressure integrity. There's still time if you expect failures to recover if you've made a mistake and, and uh, they didn't do that. So expect failures all the time and have a plan to correct the error as soon as the error is made. If I, if I have time, we'll talk about how you do that here in a bit. Develop error wisdom is another principle. What is error wisdom? So all of us have a propensity or a, 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 our own personal propensity for making mistakes. And I make different mistakes than you do. I, I make different kinds of mistakes. Maybe I make, I'll, I'll, here's another statement I've made in the past. I have more time in the simulator, the space shuttle simulator than anyone. And I've therefore made more mistakes in the simulator than everyone. Now, over time, you try to get the mistakes to be smaller and smaller with fewer and fewer consequences. But if you can understand your own personal propensity towards making mistakes, now you can devise techniques to prevent the error or certainly to prevent the consequence from occurring. Pilots are very good about preventing consequences, and I'll show you how that happens. The picture, by the way, is five 747s. Think about this the next time you jump on an airplane. And one of the folks in the audience is getting ready to go on an airplane here just shortly. Think about this. NASA did a study. Four out of every five commercial flights, or, or maybe don't think about this. Four out of every five commercial flights, an error is made by the crew on the, in the cabin. Most often, it is a communication error. And in fact, it's actually an average of 2.8 errors every time a, a flight has an error on it. Um, but pilots are very good about capturing that error. We have different techniques and principled ways of speaking to reduce the errors or reduce the consequence after the error is made. I think I have, uh, uh, by the way, here's an example just to show you that it applies not just to a dangerous environment, but also to an administrative environment. So one of the most difficult tasks we have as a crew is to design the crew patch. All of the crews are responsible for designing a crew patch. This is from SDS-63, my third mission. And we worked back and forth with some graphic designers on getting the, the patch exactly the way we wanted it. The final thing I said is, okay, make sure you uh, check it, verify it, and then once, once you're satisfied with it, I'll recommend the final design, ship it up to headquarters for approval. I'll recommend it for approval. Headquarters, this is the patch that they approved. Headquarters approved it. We transmitted it to the world. You can still see this on Wikipedia. About a week later, we started getting letters from all around the world asking, what's the significance of 61 stars in the American flag? So we had an extra two rows that we didn't catch. I didn't catch as the commander. Headquarters didn't catch, et cetera. We were able to correct the error pretty quickly on anything that was electronic. But some things you can't, like the internet, it lives forever. So it, it's still on Wikipedia if you go see it, you can see. So develop error wisdom. If we understood that before we designed the patch, we could design a technique or develop a technique to prevent that kind of an error. Um, anytime you take an action, so here's the next technique is called perform verification. Anytime I, anytime I take an action that has consequence, I verify that the action was correct. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I'm supposed to turn on GBC2 or the computer number two in the space shuttle. I reach up and I turn on number two. Did that work? Well, I don't know unless I verify it. The example here is we don't put the landing gear down until 10 seconds prior to landing. If the pilot on the right side whose responsibility is to put lower the landing gear, what if he or she forgets? Well, we're dead. There are so many things in the space program that end up with and then you die. So we don't want that. So we verify after the gear come down. How do you do it? Well, there's some indications you can see if the gear come down. What happens if it didn't work? Well, I have a set of duplicate controls on my side and I can lower the landing gear pretty quickly. The point is verify that the action I took is actually the one that I wanted and it was successful. That's called simple verification. Do it, check it. 
how do we do something a little better than verify? What if I look at the wrong indication or what if the indicator is wrong? Um, so the next level up is called redundant verification. So in the space program, we use a two person rule. So there's at least two people all the time verifying that something was accurate. It's called redundant verification. Problem with redundant verification is what if you have both the same identical flawed training and I'm looking at the wrong indicators or the indicator is wrong or there's two indicators but they're powered by a single signal conditioner. So redundant verification only works as far as the redundancy works and I may lose it. So what's a, an even more valuable method um, and we call that dissimilar verification. Here's the quick example. I know it's a little difficult to see but pilots never rely on the fuel quantity gauge alone because it can get stuck and we don't want to flame out and run out of fuel. So we use the instrument right next to the fuel quantity gauge is the fuel flow gauge and it can integrate the fuel flow over time. Same thing in a car. I know in my personal car when I'm driving on a long trip, I can't drive more than 356 miles on a tank of gas or I will run out of gas. So it doesn't matter if the needle sticks, I won't run out of gas if I'm keeping track of the miles that I've driven. So it's, a re it's a, not a redundant, it's a dissimilar method for verifying how much fuel I have left in the tank. I can time it and you know that kind of thing. That can help prevent all kinds of accidents. Um, the, you, you know the story I think of the Hubble Space Telescope. We had to refurbish it, that little white uh, rectangular thing right in the center of the solar rays, kind of in the center down below the limb of the Earth is a big white box. That's the wide field planetary camera, planetary camera that had to be replaced. So we had to give it bifocals because remember the mirror was ground to the incorrect specifications. Now NASA, here's the interesting part, NASA verified multiple times that it was precisely the way they intended to grind a mirror. But what they used to verify that it was precisely ground to the proper um, uh, spherical shape was test equipment that was flawed. So we didn't have a dissimilar method for verifying the test equipment and that's why we got into trouble. So use a dissimilar verification method. I have about 15 minutes left, I think. We're going to 11.30, correct? So I'm gonna jump ahead towards the end so I can get to some of your questions, which to me is a, a lot of fun hearing the questions. Let's go, uh, uh, tell you what, I think I'm almost done anyway as I look at my notes. Let's see what we have left. That was the last slide. Um, if anybody who has questions, go ahead and line up uh, towards the microphone in the back. Uh, remember to think about principled ways of operating uh, to help yourself be successful and always be thinking of the mission statement that you have, not just at LinkedIn, but at home. What's your mission statement at home? What are you trying to do? You know, raise a good family, you know, whatever you're trying to do. Make sure you're thinking of the ultimate goal and then take actions to support that mission. Um, I think you've seen uh, the book certainly on your chairs. This is our, at that time, two month old granddaughter. Uh, my, my daughter was reading the book and she had my two month old granddaughter with a little quote down here in the bottom. I wish I knew then what I know now. Um, develop your own techniques of, of principles, follow the mission statement and you'll be able to not only stay alive and control the risk, but be wildly successful yourselves and take your company to new heights. With that, I would love to uh, see what's on your mind and answer any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. And we have some offsite too that will come in periodically. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks a lot, great talk. Um, I was wondering, could you share uh, if you have a memorable experience of uh, um, a situation where you had to take intelligent risk in the face of uncertainty, uh, either because of time pressure or some other constraint where you didn't have all the info and you, you had to choose the, the best possible risk for the situation? Um, let me give you two quick examples. It's a good question. In the space program, you try never to take risk without having the full information. Now, clearly, sometimes you don't have the full information. Um, Here's one example that comes to mind is on my first mission, our job was to recover a satellite, big giant satellite is about the size of a small school bus, about 20,000 pounds mass. Um, Dan Bernstein, the commander, flew up next to this big satellite. Bonnie Dunbar grabbed it with the arm. And then our job was to, as she rotated around to various different positions, um, 
Marsh Ivins and, and the other crew members took pictures of all sides of the satellite. This was a satellite that was in space for six years collecting data on the environment of the uh, uh, micrometeorites and radiation coming from the sun, that kind of thing. So for six years, it's flying around the Earth in one direction, and we wanted to see the difference between the leading edge and the trailing edge. So to capture the information, initially, we wanted to take pictures of all sides. So our job, my job, was to fly the space shuttle and protect it as we flew around the Earth while she maneuvered it around. The autopilot, almost always the space shuttle is flown on autopilot. It's just like you see in movies on um, Star Trek or Star Wars or, or the commander just sitting there in a chair and maybe programming a, a computer. That's just the way it really is. Very, very rarely do we ever control the vehicle. Um, but the problem was the autopilot wasn't smart enough to handle. It, it's the classic uh, thing about the ice skater. If, if Bonnie took this 20,000 20, pounds mass and pulled it in closer to the center of gravity, if we had any kind of very small, even as low as five thousandths of a degree per second rotation rate, the vehicle would spin up. And the control system wasn't powerful enough to control that. And so the autopilot couldn't do it. And they said, well, humans, you do it. Now, it turns out that's one of the things that humans can do. I'm going to tie it up here and get to the heart of your question. So think about the advantage that humans have over computers. Computers, you have to program and train. Now, they're getting so where they're pretty good, and I don't know enough about artificial intelligence coming in the future. Um, but for now, we have to program the computer, and we couldn't program all the different scenarios. So they said, humans, you just do it. So we went into the simulator, and we figured out a couple of simple rules and crew coordination. And so I, I told, you know, Bonnie wasn't allowed to maneuver unless I was satisfied and I drove the rates to zero in all axes, plus or minus five thousandths of a degree, and then I would let her move. And periodically she'd have to stop for me to fire some jets and make sure we kept it into control for the whole three hours. So on my very first flight, I had more stick time than anyone in the, in the space shuttle just because the computer couldn't figure out and the human can. It, it's not anything to do with my special skill. It's just that, for example, as a pilot, I can land on any airplane in the world without having seen all, sorry, I can land on any runway in the world without having seen all runways. I do, it's called training. I learn a few techniques, a few principles, and follow them. Now I can take intelligent risks and do intelligent things because I have a set of rules inside of my head. Maybe I'll leave it at that. It's maybe not specific enough for you because you probably won't be controlling a, a space shuttle in the future. But if you understand the principles behind how things operate, now you can take intelligent risk. Once you understand the principles, do not violate them and be tempted to say, oh, I can, I can cheat and do it even better if, once you understand the principle. Um, I have a question. Um, in a previous job, before I was working at LinkedIn, I worked in a manufacturing plant as a manufacturing engineer. And a big part of my job was designing equipment and procedures for people to follow. And <clears throat> one of the struggles, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had was finding that balance between defining a good procedure, but also making it impossible or as difficult as possible through the actual equipment for people to make an error. And that was always a challenge. And I'm wondering if you have any advice when you're designing a system that can get into a bad state, when it's appropriate to rely on procedures and when it's appropriate to, lie, to rely on automation. And especially when considering that the people who are operating it aren't necessarily uh, people who hold advanced degrees. Yeah, so it's a good question. And it requires a, at least a, a morning symposium, or better yet, an entire week's symposium to really give you the full the full answer, which I won't have time to do. However, let me say a couple of things. Number one, highest priority is, yeah, if you can automate it, great. If you can design in guards or barriers or things in the system that prevent the human from making mistakes, great. It's so rare that we can do that. There, there's some innovative things you can do to influence the person not to make a mistake. But you do everything you can in the design phase, the engineer, the designer, to minimize uh, making errors. But remember that even with automation, 
a lot of people think one of the advantages of automation is the workload decreases for the human operator. Well, it doesn't. It maybe decreases during the operation, but now I have a whole other series of training that I have to go through to understand the automation and the degraded modes, what happens when the automation begins to fail, and it will begin to fail, and, and sometimes catastrophically, and if the humans don't understand how to monitor the autom automation, then we're in deep trouble. Um, so let me jump to the next level, which is when you do rely on humans, have a good set of procedures. It is a, a tightrope that you're walking, you know, how much specificity do we put in, how much training do we give, et cetera, on and on and on. If you're in a dangerous environment, I would err on the side, not err, I would go overboard on the training. We have extensive training before we fly in the space shuttle. We had a procedure validation process, pretty extensive to go through to verify that we got the right optimum balance between uh, too much word, wording and not too much wording, et cetera, on and on and on. It's a, it's a huge, big um, challenge that companies have. Um, but remember how, remember the advantage of the human and then make sure we are training and preparing people to use procedures properly. Uh, again, I don't have enough time to, to go through all the different ways, but you don't just have the procedure and toss it over and say, here, go follow this. That doesn't quite cut it. You have to, there's training that goes into it and how to follow the procedure thoughtfully is a series that I sometimes go through, but we don't have time today to do that. Sorry, I, I feel like I haven't given you a sufficient answer. It's a big question. Thank you. <laughs> because you asked the question, you're at least on the right track of knowing that these are the challenges that companies have. I, I know for me, every now and then when I'm looking at risk, uh, sometimes I'll even get anxious about it or I'll really zone in on it and I miss kind of the fun of the event. I'm just curious if you have any mental techniques you've used to kind of balance your looking at risk from just enjoying the drive or enjoying the run. So, yeah, again, there's, there's so many things I want to tell you. Um, the, the, the key is, I think the key is to, there's another technique that I call identify the trigger steps. Um, it, anytime you're approaching somewhere where there's potentially high consequence, then you pay attention. Um, that's called the trigger step. I already talked about going through an intersection. Various times when I'm driving, when there isn't much risk around. So I, I, it was nine hours for me to get from my house down here a couple days ago. There were stretches in the road. There was no one around me, big wide road. Uh, I could see forever. There were no cattle gonna, gonna cross the road. Now you can enjoy and look around and uh, see the scenery. But you always, there's one other concept I wanna uh, tell you before I close out this answer you always have a subroutine working in the back of your brain in a dangerous environment like driving a car that will snap you back into paying attention. And sometimes you have to have that sort of in the front of your mind, not in the back of your mind. Um, and, and, then, and then the final thing I wanted to say is sometimes you'll see in operations that you're intensely focused because things are getting critical. So we were, yes, uh, Today we were trying to get the sound right and it wasn't right. There was a, a tremendous lag in the, in the drum set. And the whole time we're focused on trying to get the sound right, part of me is also looking at the clock because I knew we had to be ready to greet the audience. Um, so the point is sometimes you're focused and sometimes you're wider field of view and sometimes it's simultaneous where you are focused and you're observing things that are around you. So the, so the final point is you can be driving and enjoying the ride, but still thinking about the hazards all the time. Once you practice this, you can do both simultaneously. You really have to do that when you're flying airplanes. And I would do things like on, on launch, I would not allow the crew members to say anything about the view or what they were seeing outside because I wanted them focused on the instruments and I didn't want to tell them don't look out, you know, I didn't want to tell them how to think. So by telling them what they were not allowed to talk about, in a sense, I was telling them what not to think about. Don't be telling me about the view out the window because it does not matter to me. I only care about the engines, the computers, the velocity, you know, energy, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
So you can do both is my final answer. Sorry, that was kind of a long answer. Hi, uh, my question is about kind of specification of the system. So I work on building infrastructure, which means I'm removed from the users of my system. And I often find that they're using the system in a way that was never intended. And somehow it is very difficult to specify the system tightly enough that they understand what to do and what not to do. They always find some technically legal, but not really intended way of kind of uh, breaking things down. So looking for some ideas on how to specify or how to navigate this uh, gray area of something that you can technically do, but you shouldn't really do. So the organization, um, it's a good question, thank you. The organization is responsible for specifying how the system is used. First of all, it's our organization responsible for how the system is designed. In NASA, we call those specifications. But they're also responsible for, for dictating or writing down how the system is to be used. Um, and, and that was a different manual, uh, I forget what we used to call it. But you will sometimes find that people are using the system in a different way. The organization has to be very uh, disciplined about not allowing this in a hazardous environment, not allowing the system to be used in an un unintended way. As test pilots, our job was to see all the different ways that people can use the system. Because um, uh, if you use the system in a, in a way that was not intended, you may have some unintended consequence in a dangerous environment, it'll kill you. In a non-dangerous environment, it might kill the corporation. You might lose share of the value or whatever, whatever happens. So the organization is supposed to do that. Now the human has to have, uh, let's, so let's say I'm in an airplane and all of a sudden I'm in a situation where I'm going to die if I use the system the way it was intended and there's no other choice. Occasionally that occurs I have to understand the principles behind the system and what are the limits and, and, and whether or not I can exceed if I want to save my life. I don't think that's the case in a, in, you know, if you're working with computers, but you are going to have people that are using the system in, a, in an unintended way. It's the organization's responsibility. The humans as users have to understand the principles behind it to make sure they don't get into an area where they get into trouble. Okay. Hi, um, Captain Weatherby. Thank you so much um, for you know uh, guiding five uh, space shuttle missions uh, safely home. I know that was challenging uh, because of all the, the history that we've had with the Challenger and Col Columbia uh, tragedies. So um, my question is this: um, You mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you talked about oh we fall we can easily fall into this complacency, and you said if we had time, you would talk about that. You remember? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, if you don't mind. So, so the first thing to, to mention, I already mentioned in the, in the talk, even in a hazardous environment on the aircraft carrier flight deck, you see people taxiing an airplane and they're looking this way and they're walking straight back towards an, an intake that's running and they make it sucked in or a spinning propeller that they don't even see because they're complacent. The first thing to think about about complacency, it's a, it's a function of becoming skilled. And becoming skilled is a very good feature in the human brain. What it means is the more skilled I am, the more practiced I am at sports or playing the piano or the drums or anything, now I can relegate the mechanics of the motion to the autopilot in the brain, the automatic processing in the brain, and it frees up my cerebral cortex to think about higher level things like like where's the band leader trying to take us or you know, how am I gonna get the ball downfield? The problem is most of the time that's okay. Most of the things we do every day, you're doing on autopilot as you're walking around and talking to people, you're thinking about one thing, but you're doing other things on autopilot. That's okay, but it's not okay on an aircraft carrier flight deck or in a hazardous environment. So the Navy has figured out there are three ways to help people. By the way, complacency is what happens when I'm in a dangerous environment, I'm thinking about something else, and I'm leaving the autopilot to run the mechanics, but sometimes the smallest things, like running into a spinning propeller, are gonna kill me. So the Navy has figured out there's three ways to help prevent complacency. Um, 
the first is to remind people routinely or periodically if it's a dangerous environment, be careful out there. Typically, we do it during the safety meeting. Uh, on, the, on the aircraft carrier, it was once a week. Sometimes companies do it once a month, whatever. Whatever the frequency is, if it's dangerous out there, be careful, don't get complacent. The second time you remind people to not be complacent is when you have an unfortunate incident or a near miss or a close call. You say, hey, this person almost died. Here's what happened. Don't let this happen to you. But the third time is the most powerful, and that is as soon as you see complacency occurring, immediate feedback right away, because that's always the, the quickest, uh, the best way to train someone is if they make a mistake or they're showing that they weren't paying attention, so the supervisor goes up and whacks you in the side of the head, et cetera. That's how we handle complacency in a, in a dangerous environment. Eventually, you see people now when they're controlling airplanes or taxiing airplanes, you watch their eyes, and they're looking around all the time. And that act of being aware becomes relegated to the autopilot, but you're no longer complacent because you're aware of the hazards, and you're skilled at operating in a dangerous environment and keeping yourself out of danger. I think we've run out of time. Let's give a round of applause for Jim. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Really appreciate having you here. It's given us a lot to think about. I just thought about a lot of stuff while I was walking up here that yep. I normally wouldn't. Very good. <laughs> Um, I also just want to give a quick shout out to Arvind Rajan. He's one of our LinkedIn alums, and he is the reason that Jim is here today. He saw him speak and then actually recommended him to me and connected us. So thank you, Arvind. So thank you all for coming today. Thanks to everyone on the stream. And if you're here, you can stick around and he'll sign books and take pictures. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks.